tonight's speaker is Kurt Schwemm. Kurt was born and raised in Philadelphia, but he lives in Medina now. That's right. right mm -hmm. here. Yes. Uh, Kurt served on a, as a non-nuclear mechanic on submarines in the U.S. Navy from 1979 to 2000. And here's Kurt. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first of all, submariner. Um, <coughs> I worked hard for those. <coughs> Don't ask me. I heard the national anthem, and now I'm all emotional. Um, I worked real hard for those, and it's a hard life for a lot of people. And so we um, we, we took that very seriously. People, um, I don't think you understand the environment that we deal with and that we are in. It's not. It's an abnormal environment. Are there any pilots that are out here? Anybody ever fly a plane? Okay. When we drive our car, we're going up 71. We're two-dimensional. Forward, reverse, left, right. In the submarine world and in the aviation world, we go up and we go down. So it's a three-dimensional world. A um, little thing we had at one point in time, if you will, a number of years ago, the USS Michigan was brand new. She's 30-some years old now. Um, she came into the Southern California op area uh, with the USS Ohio, and there were three submarines within 500 yards of different depth stratums. So we are, were all right there about the same time all together. It was a game that we were playing, I guess. I have no idea what the game was. I just went that way as fast as they told us to go. So that's what we were. Uh, volunteer Navy, volunteer submarine force, you can volunteer but you have to have a specific job rating to be in the submarine force. Uh, it is now a co-ed force, which has changed in the last, since I think 2012, 2013. So there are women on submarines. Women are not on all submarines now, um, mainly because a lot of them were designed with only one gender involved and there's not enough room to make everything work. And they're, as they start building, the newer submarines uh, to actually to replace the the Tridents that are going to be 50 years old in a few year boxes. They come up their 50th anniversary. Their hulls will be past service life. They're going to replace it. They actually cut it, started cutting steel last week for the Columbia for the mock-up for the Columbia, which is the new the next generation. So these are not given away. They're not. They're not. You have to earn them. Uh, the bottom pin down there is a, is a strategic deterrent patrol pin. Uh, every time that a, a certain class of submarine goes to sea and goes on alert status carrying around missiles, you get, a little, you get the pin and then you get stars. Um, so that's the two, the two big ones here. These are the boats I served on, USS Drum. Now the Drum was built in 1972. She was a Sturgeon class. She was 293 feet long. And I think I probably owned equipment in about 260 feet of that. So we had everything from the diesel all the way back to the, the, the stern and the rudder. That was all my equipment that we had to work on. We had all the atmosphere control equipment. We had all the trimming and draining and deballasting. And we'll kind of talk a little bit about some of those things. The next one I went on was to the Miami and the Alexandria. The Alexandria was behind. Electric boat went on strike, so they put me on the Miami. Sad day. Um, an arson fire was uh, burned on board Miami when she was in the shipyard. Um, it burnt the entire front end of the ship. Uh, 688s are two, clat or two uh, compartments, um, and it burnt the front half of the ship. They were going to try to fix it. Uh, it was going to be about a $425 million fix. And then they started looking at some pieces of the hull and they found extensive cracking in the hull. And they said, no. Uh, so sadly, they retired her. Um, and they were so worried about her trans tanking her out to Bremerton, Washington. She was in uh, Maine that they had the, there was nobody on the crew, there was nobody on it, it was a dead toe. So if something happened and it sank, it sank. Um, that was kind of a sad day when we were reading about that one. I spent, after there, I went to the George Washington Carver. Um, I made Chief Petty Officer, E7. They were gonna give me my own division to run. 
and I went to George Washington Carver SSBN 656 blue. It's the shirt I have. We put her to rest in 1993. We decommissioned her. I believe I was the last or the second to last person to walk off the ship. Um, when the ship was the one of the last pieces except for the reactor compartment came out of uh, the dry dock because that's where they cut her up right there. I was there, it was about 10 o'clock at night, it was snowy in Bremerton, Washington, and they, they pulled her out. It was kind of a sad day. We just had the 25th year reunion up in Washington. I walked into the hotel where a bunch of the guys were, and the first thing they just said was, what'd she look like when you got rid of her? And this was a guy on the commissioning crew. He wanted to know what type of shape she was in. So that was a long evening in a, an establishment where they serve adult beverages in the hotel. Um, yeah, so trying to explain to these guys that what we did, what we had to do with her. And eventually I ended up on USS Alaska, SSBN 7, 732 Blue. So that's where we did. Now the interesting thing about the Alaska, she's an, she's an Ohio class Trident submarine. Um, she was the first submarine, SSBN, to conduct over 100 strategic deterrent patrols. She hit 100. And she's still going strong. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit about the maintenance of these things. Tridents only go through one, maybe two overhauls in their entire life cycle, which is amazing. But what I did when I was on her, I was the, the maintenance material coordinator, or as the first CEO when I checked on board, who had, he had the people skills of Attila the Hun, and he had Darth Vader's lightsaber, because he'd hack you up. He had no people skills whatsoever. It was a second tour CEO, he was a full bird, and he goes, I checked in, he looked, he goes, I don't go to sea late. Yes, sir. Your job's to make me to make sure I go to sea. If I go late, guess what body part he was going to take. Um, he and I got along real well because some of the mate refits that we had were over at 60 and 70 and over we had one was 145,000 man hours. You pull in and it was the incremental overhaul. They take stuff apart that was perfectly good just to see, okay, it's all new, it's all good uh, or they make it better. Um, so those are the boats that I have served on different classes each time. Some of these got some guys spent their entire careers on one class of submarine or one type and they bounced around. I have been in the Western Pacific, I've been to the Indian Ocean, I've been to the Irish Sea in the winter, and that was not a fun time. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how submarines react. This piece of aluminum that I have up here right now, it's 35 inches long, it's sitting three and a half inches in the air. If you extrapolate that out, that's about a nine to 10 degree angle on a ship, and it's about a 40, about a 40 foot difference from the front to back. So that's the, the next world that we live in, is that dimensional world. Um, it's two-dimensional. You'll see a little bit. I've got some pictures in here. Everything I'm going to talk about, first of all, um, will come from Wikipedia, or it, it came from a Google search, or it, will, it came from, uh, there's one picture in here. It's a Facebook page. Don't know where they got the picture, but it's in public domain, so it's okay. Um, we may or may not talk about submarine operations in a generic sense of some of the things we may or may not have done. But uh, so that way I don't get in trouble. The guy back there in the camera doesn't get in trouble, and we don't do that. Every time we go to sea, it's, it's, it's a classified thing. Even if we just go out to take our depends out for the day, where we go and where we submerge was totally totally uh, totally a, a classified thing. Once you dove, that was it. I've got to read this off of here because I had it memorized at one point in time, but uh, getting, once the brain starts to go, it goes. Um, I had to tailor this a little bit because we now have women on submarines. Only a submariner realizes to the extent that the entire ship depend on him or her. Okay, Wendy. Thank you. As an individual. Uh, landsmen, uh, this is not understandable to them, and sometimes it's even difficult to comprehend, but it's so. Um, we depend on everybody. We depended on everybody that came on board that boat to do something. We were like lion. We would eat our young. We would try you. 
we would poke you, we would find out what annoyed you, and we would push you as far as we possibly could to find out what you were made of. If we didn't trust you, you wouldn't last long. Okay, because when I'm asleep at two o'clock in the morning and you're walking around the boat and you're not paying attention to something, something's a potential catastrophic situation could happen. If we don't trust you, we don't want you there. So there were some people that spent very short time. As a matter of fact, we have one guy we submerged and about four hours later, there was um, four or five of us that were sitting on him because he was trying to leave. Um, <laughs> And here came a corpsman with a big syringe of Thorzine or something in it. And he goes, I said, just don't miss. He goes, well, if, you, if I miss, you'll be, you, you won't know it for 6 to 12 hours. And this was a little guy, and he was picking up five of us. So those things uh, we found out. A submarine at sea is different than the world in, uh, in herself. Why we call them hers, well, I, I have my own philosophies on, but I'm not going to get into that. Uh, the consideration is uh, protracted in distant operations of submarines. The Navy is, uh, must place responsibility and trust the hands to take these ships to sea. Um, when things go wrong, that's how you find out what your crew is made of. We ran drills till we ran drills till we ran drills. How many times we had a fire in the, t in the trash compactor, or a fire in the galley, or a fire in the engine room. If I had a dollar for every one of those, I would be on the beach drinking a Mai Tai right now. Um, we drilled, 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 drilled. And then just when you thought you had enough, you got some inspection team that came on and did the same things over to you again. Uh, so that's what we did. Uh, you've got a $1.2 billion piece of government asset. You need to be able to handle it, and that's what we did a lot. You know, I could read the rest of this, but the bottom line comes out to be, and I think everybody understands, a lot of people in here are, were in the military or have been in the military, have military families. We were our own self-dependent, self-reliant um, vessel. We were at work one day um, a few years ago and a lady kind of broke down. She was crying and her face was running all over the place and she was having a hissy fit about something. I forget what it was. And she said, I just can't take this pressure. And I looked, I said, are you okay? And she said, well, how do you handle pressure? And I looked at her and I said, and I'm gonna direct quote, don't kick me. Uh, I said, sweetheart, I said, you wanna know what pressure is? You wanna be 400 feet under the water, on fire, injection temperature is 35 degrees on the seawater, and 911 is three to five days away. That's, that's stress, that's pressure. <laughs> and she just kind of looked at me, and then she had some uh, inappropriate comment for me. Um, and then we left, and we went to go get something to eat for lunch. We took her out to lunch. So that's really what we lived in. We lived in an abnormal environment. Um, but to me, I know the first time we submerged on Carver, um, the boat submerged, we got under there, and I turned around, and I looked at the chief of the boat, the senior enlisted guy in the boat, I looked at him, and I went, Lucy, I'm home. And that's really what it was, it was home. I mean, you had, everybody you had to depend on. So that was kind of a little bit of, a little bit about that. Um, we are a different breed, we have kind of a different sense of humor. Um, and anybody that knows me will know that. I put some designations up here because we're going to talk some acronyms. We've already done them. I was a machinist mate chief slash submarines, SS, submarine service. Uh, a PCU is a pre-commissioning unit. Now what that is, is a submarine that's being built. It has not gone to sea yet. But you have to have people there to start to monitor um, in case you didn't realize that the Shipyard cannot do, cannot do any manipulation of nuclear valves, so they had to have Navy guys do it for them, so we got the nukes were the first one there. I found this out, I was told years ago that SS meant submarine service. Well, it actually means submerged ship. Okay? If it's an SS designation, um, it's a diesel boat. 
I just ask everybody in their own special way to recognize the 52 submarines that were lost in World War II. Um, they are still on patrol, and some we have no idea where they were lost. We have a general idea, but they never been able to find them. So in your own private way, sometime when you're thinking about people or thinking about them, just think about those gentlemen that gave up their, their life so that they could defend the freedoms that we still have today. SSN is Submerged Ship Nuclear, also known as a fast attack, a hunter killer. Don't ask me about the movie. I refuse to see it. I won't pay a dollar at Redbox to go see it because uh, it seems that Hollywood somehow over glamorizes all the submarine world. Uh, so they're nuclear powered. There are two nuclear powered vessels that are still that are still on patrol. USS Thresher was lost with 129 people on board. Shipyard and Navy people in uh, January or February 1963, no, April 1963. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the outcome of that. So that's sitting off the coast of Massachusetts in about 8,000 feet of water. Um, they made no attempt to go pick her up. And then the, the Scorpion is about 800 miles east of the Azores. Uh, excuse me, west of the Azores. Uh, to this day, they still do not know what caused her to go down. Uh, they have said they sent submersibles down there. Found this on Wikipedia, so we can talk about it. Um, and they did find that there was dimpling in the pressure hull from implosion. So they, do, they probably at this point in time ruled out some type of internal explosion um, that happened with that. So again, horrible way to go horrible way to die because that's almost instantaneous but it's the idea that you know that it's going to happen real soon on the way down. So she's still out there. I believe there was 95 people on board that one. SSBN is the Submerged Ship Ballistic Nuclear or a boomer. Um, they're the ones that towed around the multiple warhead ICBMs. Carver was a 16 missile tubes, had 16 multiple warhead um, missiles on her and then the Alaska had 24. Um, in the avenues of trying to cut back on uh, between start treaties and everything like that then the Columbia which we mentioned a little bit earlier which is being worked on it's a joint venture it's electric boat is building the missile compartment they're also building a missile compartment for the British it's going to be the same exact Trident missile compartment. That way they don't, no one spends the same amount. They're spending on golly amount of research and development. This is a tried and true system. They know it works. It works very well. And we'll talk a little bit about how we can take 87,000 pounds of missile and send it on down the road. It's uh, pretty interesting. And then now we have the SSGNs, which are submerged. They're guided. They're nuclear. They're cruise missile. They're also SEAL team on board. That's the next venture. They took the first four Tridents, Ohio, Michigan, Georgia, and Florida, and converted them, pulled the missiles off, and put a converted package in there for Tomahawk. They can put six Tomahawk missiles, cruise missiles, in each tube. If you do the math, if you want to solve the problem in North Korea, put the Ohio on one side, put the Michigan on the other, and do it Thanksgiving weekend after the Ohio State-Michigan football game, and let them toss it one another. That'll fix that problem real quick. Okay, that's my one political statement for the day, sorry. Um, <laughs> but that's what they've done with her. They also put a, a dome that goes on there. I've got a, a depiction of that. I actually have a picture of it uh, that I found on Google search uh, of the SEAL teams actually pulling a, um, out their vehicle out of that. Um, so again, it's submerged. It's quiet. You don't know it's there. She kind of sneaks up, lets the boys go out, let them go do their thing, comes back in, picks them up. Thank you very much, SEAL Team 6. We love you. I had a chance to do some operations with SEALs on drum. Uh, I will simply say that they are some interesting people. <laughs> they, they thought we were nuts, and we, were, we thought you think you were nuts. So let's talk a little bit about a submarine day, OK? Uh, first of all, Somebody had this brilliant idea years ago that we have a 24-hour clock. Everybody has a 24-hour clock. In the submarine world, we have to be different. We have an 18-hour day, an 18-hour clock. 
Um, you have a biological clock internal. You know, if somebody says, I can wake up at 5 o'clock every morning, well, we kind of destroy that. It takes about four days to destroy your biological clock. We do this 18-hour day so we have the minimum amount of crew on board that can still fight the ship and drive the ship and run the ship, but they can also stay alert. And they found out that somewhere between the four and seven hour period, you start to drift while you're doing certain mundane tasks. I know nothing on submarines mundane, but that's okay. So we have a six hour watch. So we have people who will be driving the boat. We have people that will be in sonar listening for contacts. We have people in radio which is, gosh, to be one of the easiest jobs. You sit and radio until you come to periscope death. Uh, it's also heavily air conditioning. There's a lot of electronics up there, so they always had sweaters on, and even in the Indian Ocean. Thank you very much. I don't understand that. Um, and then you, after you're done with your watch, you have 12 hours off. Now, if you can see the wit and sarcasm towards the bottom down here, in your 12-hour off period, you had maintenance, you had training, you had qualifications, you had personal time, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of a joke, and sleep, maybe, but that's what we did, okay? Qualifications, like I said before, you earn your, qualifi you earn your dolphins. Your job is, when you get to the boat, to qualify something to be useless, so you're not useless, excuse me, okay? Um, because if I had to get on board the boat and, and do a, a, a a, a job, let's say we were in sonar, I wasn't qualified to be a sonar operator. And I have a friend here, Wendy, who's here, and she is a qualified sonar operator. She would be standing behind me for six hours training me on how to be a sonar operator. She could be doing other things. Um, in my job, we had atmospheric control technician and auxiliary on the watch where you monitored a lot of tank levels. You ran the diesel if you had to uh, on our boat. From that point, you would progress to senior watch stations like chief of the watch, where actually you're controlling the entire watch section forward, and then diving officer watches that will reach and maintain order depth. I had the easiest job in the world to pump water, flood water. Oops. Uh, so that's we, that's, you're always working on qualifications. If you're not working on qualifications, you're considered to be kind of a drone. All right, it's kind of funny, but. There's always something to learn. There was always something to learn. I had nothing better to do on Alaska, so we had a simulator um, for Tomahawk employment. I said to the captain, can I do that? He goes, sure. I got pretty good at that. They put us in a little curtain. It was a small little area for study area that we had, and there was a curtain in there. I saw some of the junior officers come out of there, it just sweat pouring off them, because they're changing targets and changing where they got to go and changing the vectors. And, and these guys are sweating. I just like point, click, shoot, go. Um, I did get a simulation that came back with the zero one time because I <clears throat> ran the Tomahawks through the commercial flight path of commercial airliners, <laughs> um, which was OK because I got a regrade on it. It's kind of funny because they said, well, the scenario said we're at war. Peacetime safety rules don't apply. And somebody obviously somewhere went, oh, he's got us. So I got a 3.7 on that one. Um, Out of? Four. It did real well. So our, our watch rotations normally run from midnight to 6, but actually they run from 11.30 to 5.30. Don't ask. We're always a half an hour early. And then those are normal watch rotations. So you see what happens if you only have three shifts of people on board. Someone's got to suck up that fourth one, and it's your new day. It just keeps rolling and rolling and rolling. So you can have two watches one day and only one the other days, and that's, it, that got to be old. Um, on Carver, we, were, we had four. Uh, I was considered the cowboy, and I had the, tw I had the 18 to 24 on the dive. So every day, I had the 18 to 24. So if you rotate on that, you get you wouldn't be on that watch, so you could get 30 hours off. And you know when on Alaska and I was on the Cowboy anymore, you know when I did them 30 hours. See these two right here? They made up for all those other ones. So that's what we did. Um, 
So they, they kind of do something different. I, I should say good morning, and then somebody would say, well, it's evening. Well, how do you know what's on the grill? If there's eggs on the grill, it's morning. Okay, that's, that's you know, we had, and then every once in a while they would have breakfast for dinner, which for some reason, some people just, they would just like, you know, they check out for a while. They had some fun with that one. So we talked a little bit about submarine, basic submarine qualifications. This was kind of a synopsis of an overview of what some of the qualification cards can look like. Understand these are some big areas. Um, every boat that I was on, this first phase, indoctrination and damage control, you couldn't get a signature on anything else until you got all those done. And then you had a block signature that had to be done by a senior qualified person senior watch station qualified um, before, you could, before you could move on to anything else. So you know, internal communications. We have, any, we have a couple Navy guys in here, I see. What's the 1MC? Anybody know what the 1MC is? You remember? Anybody remember? It's a general announcing circuit. That's the one that's going to everybody. So there's different circuits that we have, and, and they didn't make sense. Why didn't they go more one, two, three? Because different circuits on different ships mean different things. The navigation circuit was, circuit was a 27 MC. Why couldn't they? Oh, whatever. Uh, so we tried to keep a little bit of that naval tradition involved with that one. Uh, the four MC we had was the emergency reporting. You walk into an area, trash cans on fire, something's on fire. You come. You pull the button, emergency report, fire in conference room A, fire in conference room A. You let go of the button because that overrode everything. At that point in time, someone will generally go up, well, <laughs> they would, they would, they would announce fire in, we'll call it machinery one, which is some space that I used to own, uh, fire in machinery one. They hit the general alarm and everybody would get up and you had a whole lot of help real fast which was a good thing um, because we all had a vested interest in getting her and in, in in surviving that obviously but that put the ship there's certain procedures we were procedure oriented I mean we would hear emergency report emergency report and we would be putting this angle on the boat heading shallow if we were deep heading shallow. We did, it, you'd hear it, emergency report, and it was an automatic. Sitting there is controlling depth. That was my job, is to control the depth of the ship. I'd, you know, five, uh, ten up. <laughs> we'd take a ten up, and we'd start, to, we'd start to come up shallow. Okay, we don't know what that report is, and if obviously it's flooding, you take no more than 20, but it's 10 degrees. Start heading shallow. That way, if you have to come up and you have to ventilate the boat to get the smoke out of the boat, you're already there. You're already halfway there. Those were automatic things. They were routine. They were routine. I was sitting with a gentleman a number of years ago where my mother-in-law was. He was a pilot in World War II. Flew Corsairs. He was sitting in the chair waiting for dinner um, at, uh, I forget, we call, you can call it a nursing home. It really wasn't a nursing home. He was sitting there and his eyes were closed and I was watching his feet and his hands move. And there's a couple people that were concerned about him. I'm like, he's okay, he's okay. And then his eyes opened up, he looked at me, I'm like, do you have a nice flight? And he goes, I can still take it off and land it. <laughs> okay, and I said, that's kind of funny. And then I went through all the sequential steps to submerge the submarines. So I still have those ingrained in my head and I, I still do. So these are the major systems that we, we, we want the people to know. First of all, with everything that goes on, can you draw it? Can you draw the system? Yes, no. Can't draw it? Goodbye. Go back. Learn how to draw it. We want them to understand the drawing because you put your hand on it, you see it, you operate it, and you can draw it. Chances are it's going to stick in your head. It might make no sense to anybody whatsoever, but the one time we need something happen, and they know where that valve is, they, that, that guy can shut it. That radioman can go down there and shut an air valve off and stop the airflow from blowing into the torpedo room. High pressure air leak's not a good thing. Okay, those are the things we want everybody to know. Ship's propulsion, electrical, secondary propulsion. This was the area right here that uh, was my all my forte. Was the auxiliary systems in here? 
Uh, I had all the hydraulics, which was 3,000 pounds. I had all the air system, which started at 4,500 pounds and reduced down to 20 pound air. Uh, potable, or it's actually they say it's potable, but I call it potable water. Uh, our water system, Mike's thing to have on board a submarine. Uh, we can make our own water. Uh, ships high pressure air, hydraulics, service air, air conditioning, refrigeration. Yeah, you'd like to have some air conditioning back there. It gets a little warm in the engine room, and of course we want refrigeration because we don't want meat that's kind of nasty looking. Um, atmosphere monitoring. That was the, probably the second most critical thing I had to work on, was to keep the atmosphere clean. All right. So we had CO2 scrubbers. We had machines that would actually have a chemical process, would absorb CO2 when it was cold. When you heat it up, the CO2 would boil off. At that point in time, the CO2 gas was compressed, went into a seawater system, disappeared over the side. Tiny little bit, and then we actually went through a diffuser so there was no bubbles. We got rid of the CO2. We took the carbon monoxide that was on there, we set it at about 600 degrees, six, 700 degrees, and we would burn it, and we would, through a catalyst conversion, through a catalyst, we would make, we change the carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide, so then we could get it off the boat. Um, we had electrolytic oxygen generators. We made our own oxygen out of quintessentially it started as seawater at one point in time. So we could make our own oxygen. Um, which well in itself was an interesting process, but you know those are the things that we had to do. You had to maintain that monitor. You want to come up and run a blower to recirculate the air because that blower is extremely loud. It makes radiated noise. You can hear it a long way away. You want to be silent. You want to stay away. You want everybody not know that you're there. All right. uh, we talk about, everybody always asks me, what's the worst thing that you're scared of? Mine was fire. Because there was nowhere to go. Had to put that out. I got on board George Washington Carver as a young chief petty officer. I think I had eight years in the Navy. We got there. Um, and they weren't very good at their damage control, which was kind of scary. So my, my whole mantra was we were in an off crew. And on, on the SSBNs, you have two crews. One crew has the boat, the other crew's back training. We spent a lot of time in the firefighting and the uh, flooding trainer in Groton, Connecticut, almost to the point that we knew what every scenario was going to be because we were in there about every week with a group of people. Um, don't do that in the winter because the water really wasn't that warm and quite frankly I looked like a prune every time we came out of there so um, and then we went in the firefighting trainer and we put the fires out literally it light of there's a fire right there put it out okay so spent a lot of time with those guys doing that and we went from they did a thing called a tactical readiness evaluation where they evaluate how well you could handle your ship and we went from below average on damage control to we got the damage control award for the squadron the next year. So I, when we decommissioned that, she, that award came home with me. I kept that one because that was a lot of hours. I sucked up a lot of so, uh, smoke and sucked up a lot of cold water doing that for basically two off crews, trained the whole crew on how to do that kind of stuff. So those are the things. Now, the one question that always inevitably comes up when we talk about with people is, what do you do with all your wastewater? Anybody want to go there? Okay. Uh, how many people like seafood? People like seafood? Uh, you might not want to be eating some things here shortly. Um, by law, no ship can discharge black water. That's what the term is called for it. Let's call it exactly what it is, um, within 12 mile, nautical miles of land of the United States. We would not discharge black water 14 miles from land. We had that two mile oops factor just in case. Uh, so we would not discharge that. On the older submarines, that was a tank. You will shut some valves, isolate the tank. You pressurize it to about 15 to 20 pounds above sea pressure. You open a couple of valves, and it went right to the sea. Um, with that, you were also 
had signs that you would put that say blowing sanitaries. Um, periodically some people would get up in the middle of the night and not read that sign and they would pull the little lever to go flush their <clears throat> waste products. Yeah, you can just imagine what's going to happen here. So we got a little smart when we started getting a little uh, there was one particular class of boat that the tank, the, the actually the, the ball, the, the toilets actually sat on top of the tank. So if they took a hard roll and the valve was partially open, yeah, you'd be in the boat. So we came up with this an ingenious system where it's a cam sewage pump where it actually grinds it first and then it goes through a, a, a pump and then it's discharged over. Um, the sea is very forgiving to organic material. Um, we were pump we were blowing sanitaries one night off the coast of San Diego. We were probably about 100 miles off the coast of San Diego, and suddenly we were inundated with 1.8 billion krill shrimp. We couldn't hear. We had no idea where we were. The CDCs, which had the displays for sonar, were all solid green, 360 all the way around. We had no idea where we were. Well, they, they couldn't quite go as fast as we could, so we sped up a little bit, and then we got away from them. And then after that, somebody says, uh, he goes, what kind of shrimp are they? And I just looked at them and said, the ones we don't want to eat. Um, so that's, what, uh, that's how we took care of that. Now, when we got into port, we would have, obviously, we had ecology connections, and we would take all that to, we would go to the sanitaries. And I will admit, will admit you have to stop recording now, because this is, uh, this is serious. I was the one that blew the manhole cover 17 and a half feet in the air in Pearl Harbor. Thank you very much, because I used a little too much pressure. That was in middle, and I think the statutory limitations ran off on that one. So there was some guy out there who was going to find whoever did that and was going to kill him. Uh, so if he's still alive, he can come get me. So that's how we do that. Uh, really cool thing here, ballistic submarine fire control. Okay. Someone's going to ask, and so we'll, we'll keep that one up. I have the time zone map up here. Conveniently, the, our world is in 24 hour or 24 different time zones. So how do we know what time we're supposed to do what? You see in the bottom, it says UTC. There's a Meridian Dateline. Uh, is it not Meridian Dateline. Uh, Greenwich. Greenwich Mean Time. There you go. Thank you. GMT or general military training, or can I just roll over and not go? Um, that was me. So everything's based off what time it is at UTC in that, in that time zone, Greenwich Mean Time. So, yep, Every, Army's the same way, Air Force is the same way, everybody's the same way. The problem when you get into that is we had some submarine captains that wanted to, the second we go out the port, they wanted to convert, and that's called Zulu time. They always want to put it on Zulu time. So when you come up to periscope depth at night, you would rig control for red for a period of time so your eyes get used to it. And then they would go to black so that when you look at the periscope, you could see if you're going to hit something or something was going to hit you. Well, at 2 o'clock in the morning when you're coming up and your CO decides he wants to be on Zulu time, and you're coming up at 2 o'clock in the morning and you pop up and there's the bright sun up there, there's something wrong with that picture. Uh, so, but we had one CO that was like that. Everything was on Zulu. I'm like, okay, do you want us to come to work at Zulu? Seven o'clock Zulu would be like, uh, that's like 11 o'clock. I'm not coming in 11 o'clock at night. Um, so that's how, and all military guys know Zulu. They all know that that's the way if they say they want something somewhere at a certain time, it's all based off that. Uh, some people, I didn't know what the scope of how many people were. We're going to be here for this one. This is kind of like the internals of a submarine. This is what they look like inside, more or less. I can tell you that they're all going to have torpedo tubes. Some are going to have, if you see in the front, way up in the front up there by that big dome, that's the sonar sphere up there. There's vertical launch tomahawks that they've put up there. Okay. I can use my thing over here. Just don't whack the screen. These are all vertical launch tomahawks that are go up there. Um, nice invention, by the way. 
nice invention, made this warship a lot more capable. But if you look at the dimensions on this thing right here, there ain't a whole lot of room, is there? No. Remember that thing that said personal time? Yeah. Personal space might be in the laundry that is probably about this big over here in the corner where you're sitting down, and that's about the only personal space you get because nobody really wants to wash you, watch you wash your clothes. Um, in there you have communication suites, you have sonar suites, you have the control room where they actually physically drive the ship. Um, you have some type of navigation that goes on there. This little thing down here called the cruise mess, it's called the galley. I always thought it was kind of interesting because they called the, uh, the cooks were called mess specialists and they were mess specialists because they could make a mess. Um, I had an ongoing feud with an individual. He kept breaking the food mixer. I kept having to make new shafts for the food mixer because you can't quite call Hobart when you're 400 feet under the water and say, I need a new shaft. He liked to speed shift it. And I think it got to the point in time where I told him one of these days, this hammer in your hand are going to have an accident. I think I made four on one patrol in Alaska for him. So the next time we went to sea, I got smart, and I had 10 of those drive shafts. When we decommissioned the ship and we turned our supplies back in, guess how many drive shafts we had in our supply system? Nine. So that was one particular guy. Um, in there you have chilled storage, frozen. You've got the torpedo room down below. You've got an auxiliary room just right in this little pokey area in here. Inside there you've got a diesel engine, you've got an oxygen generator, you've got two, you have a scrubber, you have the burner, you have a burner down there, and you have also one thing that's kind of missing here is a fan room. There's one main ventilation system fan, that, or one main, all the vent fans go there. Um, interesting thing, how do you, how do we prevent fires on a submarine? Anybody got any, any clue how we do that? Come on. There you go. So what we did, this is why I'm bald. Tried to file a claim with VA, it didn't work. Um, I'm just kidding. We would take uh, oxygens like 20.5% and normally, yeah. We take it to 19 and a half. Cuts down the arcing and sparking and switch gear. And we also let the CO2 get a little higher because that helped suppress it. Everybody ever have a CO2 headache before? All right, pretend like there's a little guy in your head with a ball peen hammer and he's just whacking. That's a CO2 headache. Being the atmosphere control technician, I could take that oxygen generator, instead of sending the oxygen to the storage banks, I could hit a little switch and give a little sum for me. And I knew where it bled and I'd just stand over there. Oh, and that headache would go right away. Okay, and then periodically, you know, I had one day we were down there and the captain walked in, he looked at me, and I looked at him, I go, and you go in the back corner, he goes, yep. About three minutes later, he comes back around, he goes, that's better than Tylenol. I'm like, you can take 20 Tylenol, you're not gonna kill that stuff. Um, so yeah, we would, we would, and then every once in a while you get caught and you bleed inboard a little too long than you should have, and then your, C your O2 level is too high in the machinery area, and we flash a little digital light, and you're like, oh. So now they put something up on the ballast control panel, and we'll show you a picture of that here in a little bit. In fact, we'll just get moving on past that one. That's the new, that's the new SSN21, big thing. Found this online. Actually, if you look at it, it's uh, all hands from General Dynamics and Newport News Shipbuilding, uh, owned by the one thing, owned by the same company, actually. They have propulsors. They don't have a screw anymore. It's actually rotary, and it's through nozzles, and it pushes out the back. Uh, she's got 12, I think I got a picture of it in here. Yeah, I got one later. She has a seal chamber, so the seal team can go right out through there. They have the little dry deck in the back. Uh, that's the second submarine on top of that one. And if you look at the bow over here on the, the fair water, right in here, they've actually put a piece of fair steel in there. They found it, it, 
increases its speed by probably about a knot, knot and a half. It also cuts down on radiated noise. The big thing's cutting down on radiated noise. I found this online too. So everyone always says, well, how do you make, how do you take a nuclear power and how do you make it work? Um, nuclear power reactor, real simple. Just a big tea kettle. Just a big tea kettle. Think of it that way. The rods, when they're sitting in the, in the bottom, are good. They start to raise the rods up. Electrons start flowing. Water starts heating up. It gets hot. They actually have natural circulation. Comes up to a steam generator. Well, you got hot water and cold water. Which way is it going to flow? Hot heat transfers to hot water from hot to cold. Makes steam. Steam comes back down into the turbines. Turbine generator is uh, our favorite friend because it keeps the electricity on, keeps the lights on. Um, main propulsion goes through there. And then as it's used, it can becomes condensate, then it goes through a pump, and or it becomes condensate, then it can becomes feed, and then it goes back to the steam generator. So the two never mix. The two will never mix. Um, depending how much steam you put through there, how fast your turbine turns, it goes through reduction gears. There is a clutch. The clutch is there so you can disengage it in case you have a problem and you can use your electric motor. Good luck coming home with that thing. Probably get about four knots. Take you forever. And then there is, it says that thrust block in there. That's really cool. It's a hydraulically controlled thing. Without that, the, the screw would just shoot right out the back. Okay, or it would come straight forward depending on which way it goes. So it takes that rotary, rotary and changes it to uh, come on, rotary into, yeah, different, different energy that pushes it that way. Without that, the, um, the thrust block back there, you, you would never get it. That's how it all works. It's real simple. It's real simple. I watch guys, when they come on board the boat, and they were all worried about this. I'm like, really? This is a tea kettle. This is like a little hot water over here, and this is what we use it. Um, that takes up most of the, the ship is the engineering spaces. This is pretty cool. This is how you drive it. Well, this is how we used to drive it. Now we have two guys that are co pilot and co pilot. Everything's fly by wire. Um, the two guys that are sitting in a chair looking at that red screen. They're the helmsman and planesman. Usually the guy closest in the front. He's got the rudder and the fairwater or the bow. The guy in the back's got the stern. Uh, the stern planes are really, because they're so far in the back, if you get them to jam, <coughs> take a real good depth description pretty quick. So they're got to play attention. The guy with the bald head that kind of looks like me over there, but it's not, that's your chief of the watch. He controls all the ballast. He controls all the pumps and the ballasts. He's the communication guy for the officer deck. He's got all the alarms. All the indications that are up there. Um, this is usually what I did was sit there and pull my hair out because we were either off depth or off course. Uh, ship's control, diving officer of the watch. I would control depth. Uh, in order to shoot a missile, you have to have zero depth, zero speed, and you have 526 foot of boat sitting like this at a depth, no speed. Speed is your friend, because if you're heavy, you sink. If you're too light, you're going to go up. We'd sit like that, and then you could launch. So that was my job, and a lot of fun doing stuff like that. Um, I got a little overzealous on Carver after we did a crew combine. When the, we combined the crews, and we came out to the uh, state of Washington, uh, we'd taken the missiles off, and the Berlin Wall fell when we were in Puerto Rico. Okay. So, yeah, let me get through some of these. I have a little thing I want to talk to you about the 41 for Freedom. This is a Trident uh, ballast control panel. Um, found this one online. I think I know who the guy is right there, so I won't talk about that too much. You see these, little, these different color levers that are up here? Those are the alarms. Okay, they went, a number of years ago, they went to an electronic diving alarm. It sounds like a bull moose in heat. It's terrible. Uh, give me the old style Claxton. I, that's my wake up alarm in the morning. It goes off for that. 
Those were controlling all the pumps. We had depth control, we had hovering systems on here. This whole panel right here is for missile compensation. Okay, when you shoot a missile, let's see, I, I think I still have a picture of this. We'll get into this one. Oh, here we go. Now we have a little fun. Uh, if you slept in a small box like this, you might be a U.S. salty dog. That is the picture taken inside a bunk inside the chief's quarters of, uh, I believe, one of the old submarines, uh, one of the old FBM submarines. Notice there isn't a whole lot of room. It is eerily, eerily, eerily similar to an oversized coffin. Um, yeah. If you turn sideways, I probably had about six inches here. Um, that white bag in the far corner down there is your laundry. Oh yeah, and you get to do laundry once a week. Yahoo! This is the inside of a torpedo room. Believe it's a 688 uh, class submarine. Literally, just don't look at anything here except the wiring bundles up top. I can tell you that there's 5,000 miles of cable in there. I have no idea, but I think there's pretty close to that. It's a couple thousand, about 1,000 or 2,000 miles of cable on there. That's a Mark 48 exercise torpedo. Now, how do I know it's exercise? Because it's orange in the middle, okay? Uh, it's pretty embarrassing when one of those washes up in La Jolla, California on the beach. They get a little upset about that when a green one washes up there. Uh, I first got to... Um, San Diego a number of years ago, and that was the big stir on the thing. There's a torpedo on the beach in La Jolla. I'm like, what's La Jolla? Eh, it's a pretty pricey area in California. Uh, so that's how they're stowed in there. And when you take angles on the ship, they will actually, you can actually watch them move forward a little bit or move back a little bit. The first time you see that, you go, <gasps> and after a while, it's like, yeah, no big deal. They're not going to go anywhere. Um, but that's a Mark 48 torpedo, wire guided. The big silver thing in the back is where they have all the spool of wire. So you can shoot it and then send it out this way and go, wow. Yeah, okay, so this guy thinks, okay, you shot at somebody over there, we're not over there, over here, and then you can turn it on him. Um, so that's how those things go. This piece right here will come up so they can slide across. Pretty interesting one. Now this next one right here, I will neither confirm nor deny that that is an alpha submarine that belongs to the USSR. I will neither confirm nor deny those are crosshairs of a US submarine. But you can figure out what that is. Biggest things with SSM was they were intelligent gathering um, and fleet support. Wherever you see the $13 billion aircraft carrier running around, there's at least one submarine, probably two. Don't want anybody getting near that. Um, who, when was it? The Iranian hostage crisis. We were in, deployed in the Indian Ocean, and we picked up sounds of a Russian submarine, and we called it a Kenmore, because it sounded like a Kenmore washing machine um, in spin cycle. We tracked her all over the place. The only reason why she was of interest to us is because she had ship-to-ship -ship missile capability. She was an old Echo diesel submarine. They had to surface to shoot it. I mean, they had to surface, we were probably sunk it with a 30-30. With a um, but so that's a lot of what we did. We protect, we serve, and then the other part of what we're doing now is, uh, again, we found this on the internet. There it is. SEAL teams pulling uh, their vehicle out of that bubble we had in the back. SEAL team guys in there doing that. So those are some of the things that we do. One of the things, the other thing and to get in here is uh, because we converted the Tridents to Tomahawk, this is the old style on the far, far side over there of how we had the Tomahawks put in. That's a 688. It's an older 688. What they got smart, somebody got brand. They put two same size hatches and put two six packs of tomahawks. Same hatch. Hello. That way you're not, uh, some cost savings were found there. Anybody find humor in that? 
find that to be hysterical because somebody actually made that up and put that on a can. Uh, this is another little piece of humor on here. See the three kids, they got their little sailboats, mom and dad got them for something. And here comes Spiffy along with, uh, yeah, he's an MIT grad. He gets his little submarine, he puts it in the water, and they're all watching him, and he's gunning around there, and Spiffy sank their boats, and you can see his submarine just disappearing over here. I found that to be rather hysterical also. When somebody sent that to me, I laughed profusely. For $30,000 a year, would you live here without a TV, phone, internet for seven months? Working 13 plus hours a day without weekends off or holidays, uh, besides being on call and that bed, uh, you have to share with someone else sleeps there, or something you have to sleep with someone else uh, sleeps there while you're working. Sometimes we have too many people on board the boat and we don't have enough beds. So we take, they take three guys and they'll put them in two bunks. And then they make sure they're in different watch sections. So that way one, get one there's always two guys in bed and one guy on watch. And one guy gets off, the other guy's already been, he's already gotten up to go on watch. It's called hot racking. Yeah, that's fun. How many guys you got on board? Well, we got 185 people. We got 185 people. We got 168 beds. Here we go. All right. Let's, yeah. Especially when uh, what would happen if you take guys from the shipyard, especially getting ready for doing overhaul. We took some people out in Alaska. I think we had 192 people on board, and it was like we had temporary bunking up in the upper missile compartment. We had rat. We had blow up beds everywhere, and I just like uh, whatever. This is ridiculous. But that's what we have to do. So here's we're gonna have a little little fun. Simulate submarine life at home. Uh, sleep on a shelf in your closet because that's about what size they really are. Uh, replace it uh, with a closet door, replace the closet door with a curtain, and then have somebody come every couple hours, wake you up and say wrong rack with a very bright flashlight. Uh, repeat back everything that you say because everything that they said to me when I was on the ship was an order. Dive, make your depth 130 or 160 feet. Make my depth 160 feet. I full rise in a fair water plains, three degree up, chief of the watch, flood, drain, whatever you have to do for water. Everything's repeated back. Uh, don't, any, don't eat anything that didn't come out of a can or have water to it. See, that can water thing was just absolutely, dehydrated water was absolutely perfect. Um, all the ham that you eat, we used to eat in the boat, canned ham. Why? Because you could store it, canned ham. You wouldn't have to worry about anything happening to it because it's in a can. Um, dehydrated stuff. We, Submariners get more, they get more money per man for a submarine to feed than anybody else in the Navy. So if you had really good cooks that knew how to balance their books and knew how to do all this stuff, periodically during halfway night they'd break out these, they'd break out three or four number 10 cans of dehydrated shrimp. Oh yeah, they were really good. You tell that to people that were in the Navy and they go, they didn't have such a thing. And I'm like, I will find a picture of it. Uh, it weighed absolutely nothing, but when you, and they were little things, and when you got them, you soaked them for about, uh, about six hours and they got really big, they were good. Tasted really good. So uh, again, with that one, uh, renovate your bathroom, build a wall across the middle of your bathtub, move the shower head to chest level, right here. Don't ask me why, but every sailor is five foot four. Um, and then yeah, well, yeah, it's just shower once a week, shower about every 60 hours. Oh, and when you take a shower, you only use two gallons of water or less. Thank you very much. All right, we call it a rain locker. Call it a rain locker deliberately. You get in there, you throw the water on, you get wet, you turn it off. <coughs> I didn't get my soap wet. So then you kind of hoping to get some dribble on it, and then you suds up real quick. And then you turn it all on, you get it all off, and then you realize you didn't get the shampoo out of your hair. Oh. Yeah, that was always kind of fun. Um, put the lube oil in your humidifier. I always thought that was kind of funny. My wife didn't get that one. Um, instead of water, it would give you the smell of the submarine. Remember, you have cooking oils. You have hydraulic oil in there. You have a number of other <laughs> human smells. Um, and it was a unique smell. 
a unique smell. I remember we were down in uh, we were down in Puerto Rico, and I was standing there in line with some people. Um, we were getting at the exchange, and this young lieutenant said, tapped me on the shoulder and said, "You need to take a shower." And I turned around, looked at him. He had little tent bars on his collar, and he had a pair of wings on. I looked at him and said, "See these?" He goes, "Yeah." I said, it "Means I'm authorized to stink. Next time, go home." I turned around, and he was going to say something, and it was obviously he was the XO of his air wing was right there. He goes, "Son, he's a submariner. He just might put his foot right upside the back of your backside." And I'm like, "Thank you very much." So those are some of the things we do: uh, buy all the food in cases and then store the cans on the floor and walk on them, okay? Um, I was on drum, we went to sea, we had literally had to eat our way to periscope depth when we got the Indian Ocean, because we were all walking on cans, okay? For some reason, the lima bean cans never got to the boat as we were loading them. We never bought cardboard on board because there's cockroaches in cardboard. Don't want cockroaches on your submarine. Um, and I will say one time for a little bit of a little bit of entertainment and humor, um, we had a very large fly in the Philippines that was on the boat for about four or five days after we left the Philippines. He expired. I made a coffin out of toothpicks for him because I was bored. Don't ask me why, but then somebody said something to Captain, and Captain says, "I am not getting in my dress whites and shooting him at the bottom of the boat," and that's. How we got rid of our trash with the trash disposal unit. Big 11 inch hole, put your trash in cans, you weigh them down, your wet garbage goes in a wet garbage can, you put weight in there, you open the bottom of the, the open the, the ball valve up and bye bye. So littering all over the bottom of the floor, TDU cans. Now you know why you really don't want to be eating them lobsters? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. And you were liking the shrimp. Yeah, I was liking the shrimp because it was dehydrated. Okay, so we said this is a 3D world. That's where I have a little bit of fun. Um, these gentlemen, for some strange reason, have decided that they are going to stand the wrong way during angles and dangles. Uh, a couple of them are in the wrong way. A couple of them are hanging on the overhead. This guy that's hanging on the overhead right there, if he loses his grip, he's going to take out one, two, three, four, five people. We can take a bunch of people out. This is probably, I figured out to be about a 30 degree angle. So if this is 10, my Fitbit said I'd make my weekly goal. Yay! So if this is 10 up here, that's a 30 degree angle right there. Third degree angle. You know what I call this? This is called thank you taxpayers for giving me a $1.2 billion toy to play with. It's like a slide. It, this, it looks like a slide, okay? I will neither confirm nor deny that I have actually waxed certain parts of the missile compartment decking so that when we take angles, you get on a piece of wool blanket and you go surfing. I never did that. It's actually illegal because somebody lost balance and fell into a missile tube and ended up with a concussion and some broken bones and they had to fly them off. I call that, okay, you were a little too stupid. So yeah, we did have some fun with that one. The first time we left uh, Puerto Rico with a combined crew, captain was an SSNCO. He didn't like the way the boomers operated. He wanted to operate like a boom. He wanted to operate like an SSN. He wanted to be aggressive. And I flopped a 25 degree angle, leaving periscope depth on the boat. Crash, boom, bang, hearing stuff come flying, something whizzed past my head. It was a coffee cup that was up in the overhead, came past my head, hit the ship's control panel, exploded in 19 billion pieces, and everything, and people are screaming. The XO's up there screaming at me. I mean, what he had to say to me was not repeatable in public, and I'm on a microphone. Um, and it's being recorded. So, and all of a sudden this voice, this voice from the bitter darkness of the, the con where the captain was sitting, gone. Gee, Schwam, anytime you want to just treat this like a Ferrari, feel free. And I'm like, except when the deep frat fryer is on. He goes, yeah, okay, all right, I'll give you that one. Uh, they used to tell us when the deep frat fryer would be on so it wouldn't take a big angle because if you expose the heating elements in the oil, yeah, a whole lot of people have to get up and put a nasty fire out. So. Uh, 
yeah, we had fun with that one. And then there's this one that was floating around for a while. I sent some people and maybe uh, Wendy got it. Uh, that is actually a picture taken um, about a 25 degree angle. If you can see, that's the bug juice machine. Well, we can't call that bug juice machine anymore. The beverage machine, the beverage dispenser, pardon me. Um, and you can see the liquid levels. Don't call it what it is. Bug it's bug juice. Uh, it's something nasty. We have no idea what it is. And there's a whole lot of sugar and it just hypes you up. But that's how you have to live, OK? That's a, any given time. We used to have coffee cups. They were white, and they had two blue rings that were probably about this far from the bottom, from the top of the cup. And you always, people always used to get mad. Oh, what fool! I'm like, okay. Well, if you take an angle, and you have a full cup of coffee, or it's just barely up to the top. Where's the coffee going to go? Right out. All right. Well, where I sat on on Carver in Alaska, my coffee cup was right behind me. Where is it going to go? Right down my back. So I use a hat in my hand, <laughs> a little gyroscope in the hands. 41 for freedom. From 1960 to 1966, these, four sub, these 41 submarines were built. One of the most aggressive times that they've ever had in building submarines. The first four, the George Washington class, three of the four, actually, it was, yeah, it was those five of them. I think it was four of them were actually in construction to be SSNs, fast attacks. They stopped, they cut them in half, and they added this new thing called the missile compartment. They put 16 missiles on it. So as they were doing that, then the next was Ethan Allen, which was actually designed to be an SSBN, but they still had a lot of the SSN stuff with it. So the George Washington did not have the, the, power, the nuclear power plant capable to push it at high speed. Uh, speeds greater than 20 knots, depths greater than, what's the official number now? Let's say 400 feet. I know that was a good number. Um, then the Lafayette class came along. They built these guys fast. And if you looked at, if you looked at this one right up here, the, oh, you don't have the, it's in the cursor and it doesn't show up on there. From the George Washington class to right down the USS George Washington Carver, the boat that I was on, they looked entirely different. Inside, outside, the missile compartment was fairly much the same, but all the other stuff, there was more amenities, there was more space, there was more, there was more, there was more. Um, along this point in time, they also moved uh, the Fairwater, which is now gone, they put bow planes on, they moved the Fairwater higher on, or actually moved into the center of the, uh, the sail, uh, so we could get better um, depiction of, or better depth control. Okay, understand that the back of an SSBN is flat. We were in the North, North Sea one night, and we were turning. We were at uh, probably 170, 180 feet, and we were turning with real heavy seas. I made the crucial mistake of turning, and we got the angle off the boat. The object is to take your butt, your the back end of the boat, pardon me, the stern and drop it down and turn because now you have this big flat piece of well we turned at the wrong time and the wave came in such a way it reached down it grabbed the back of the boat from 180 feet and I'm sitting in the chair and I could feel that you ever you ever go over a hump or a thing and you feel that little whoop de woo yeah well I felt the big whoop de woo I went on a 180 foot wild Mr. Toad's ride straight up. The whole boat did. Into Sea State 5, which is 35 or 40 foot sea, 30 foot seas, straight up, and there wasn't a thing I could do about it. All I could do was worry about stowing our communications buoy that we were towing along. Austin Deck recommends stowing the buoy, recommends stowing the buoy, stow, recommends. Chief of the Watch stow the buoy. He goes, What? I just went over stowing the buoy. Uh, we were also told, don't be the next guy not to come back without the buoy because someone was going to get fired like the CO. And literally as the buoy went, pulled into its cradle and the clamshells came shut, we went to the surface, probably in about 30 second peri 30 second period, straight up. I just attribute to the 
hand of God said, George Washington Carver, I want to see you now. Thank you. That's a depiction of what the inside of an SSB looks like, real quick. Uh, there's a couple of, couple of things I really want to touch on, but we really didn't have time to go touch on them. I can tell you that right now, um, there are at least two SSN, two SSBNs that are out there right now, toting around missiles, protecting. Their job is nothing more than to say, please come find us, you can't, and to come home with all her birds. That's what her job is. That's what their jobs are. The 41 for Freedom, I firmly believe, um, broke the Soviet Union's back. The director for Russian rocketry was on board the USS Alaska watching our command and control with his equivalent of STRATCOM, which was a four-star general, or four-star admiral, uh, Air Force general at the time, watching how we did command and control to shoot missiles. Kind of like, you know, you let the bad guy in the back door, um, and we had him there. And we were at lunch, and he said, if you only knew how many billions and billions and billions of dollars that the Soviet Union spent to find the 41 for freedom, that you would be astonished. Um, so those boats named after presidents and famous Americans, those were the ones that I firmly believe uh, had, a, had a strong hold on well, the breaking up of the Soviet Union, although some people still say they're not there, but they're still quasi there, but whatever. Um, like I said, I'm proud to be a submariner. I will always be a submariner. Um, I'm proud to call myself a bubblehead. Um, some people think that's a derogatory term now. Go figure. Um, but uh, I will always consider myself that. And we always seem to find one another wherever we are. I always run into a guy, I'll have a hat on or this shirt on, a guy goes, oh, you are Carver, I was on the Lewis and Clark. <laughs> so uh, if you have any questions, we got 15 minutes, about 10 minutes before we get kicked out of here. Um, we weren't happy to entertain him. Okay, yes? You mentioned that you're from Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Did you ever operate out of the Philadelphia Navy? Base? No, no. The only place you can put a nuclear-powered submarine in is Groton, Connecticut, Norfolk, Kings Bay, Georgia, San Diego, and uh, Seattle, Washington. That's the only place you can put the nuclear ones. Uh, we would go on a Western Pacific deployment for six to seven months. Uh, the longest time I was submerged kind of got kind of murky, probably, depending on how you did it, between 85 and 95 days. I almost drowned on Christmas Eve uh, one year when we were over in the Indian Ocean. Our head valve, which is an air-operated valve that opens to bring air into the ship, one of the hoses got a puncture in it. Um, we went up to change it. It was perfectly flat seas, looked like Lake Erie. We took a rogue wave, and I was in water up to here as I was changing it. I will say that when I came back down into the boat that evening, there is no alcohol on board submarines, but I had a cold beer that evening. Don't ask where it can. Never ask, don't, don't ask, don't tell. Um, and I, because my squishy little shoes would squeak, 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 all the way to the shower to take a shower. And they let me take more than a two-minute shower, so that was a thing. Anything else? Yes, Wendy. Did they ever do um, hammocks? No. Or was that just on the... The problem with the hammock is it moves. Yeah. And, yeah, okay. Most of the bunks go forward to aft, so you stick on an angle. You stand on your head, you're standing on your feet. Uh, except on the Trident, some of those guys, uh, they take an angle and they'll roll out of their bed. Um, and then there were times when, you know, you would get... Not only do you do it this way, but you get this way. We took a roll... Uh, one time we went uh, 30 degrees port and 40 degrees back to starboard. We snapped it all over the place. Um, and that was, uh, we, we called that particular adventure the Barfomatic because there was a number of people that were sick that day. Uh, so, yeah. Yes, sir. I joined the Navy to be a nuclear power mechanic, okay? I got into a school, 
Uh, I at, at the Great Lakes right after the remember the riots in the Great Lakes in the late 70s there was some rioting going on up there I got up there and I developed cellulitis and I was put in the hospital the communication up there was shoddy at best I came back after being in the hospital for four or five days six days eight days I forgot how many days I was there I was actually discharged two days after because the doctor who discharged me was discharged from the Navy uh, and I had to go take an exam the day I came back I wasn't ready for it so I joined, I got in the submarine force simply by, um, I, I kind of complained about something one day somewhere and somebody heard me and it was a guy, we're in dolphins. He goes, well, you don't want to go to the U.S., I think it was the FIFO I was going to go to. It was a little tin can. It was like seven feet off the water line off the back. I don't want no part of that because I knew where my head was going to be most of the time. Um, I was going to get sick. So I joined that and then from there you go to sub school. Um, submarine school was interesting. Um, why they did psychological evaluations in the afternoons on Friday, I'll never know because you took your test in the morning at sub school every week, 2.5, stay alive, two point, you get 2.5 on your grade point average to stay alive at sub school. Um, and then we'd take a test in the morning and then at lunch everybody would run over to the club and have beer and then they'd come back from the club and then you have psychological evaluation testing in the afternoon after drinking Budweiser. Hello. That's a sign. That's your first sign that they were testing you. Who was smart enough not to do those things? I loved it. I loved it. I mean, a lot of guys didn't make it through there because of that. A lot of guys couldn't swim either. That was always a strange thing. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Were you ever able to spend R&R &R at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel? No, I actually was the uh, high co is, is now the Hayako Hotel. It's the, is the military hotel out there in Hawaii. I spent, uh, as a matter of fact, when Alaska pulled in there and we had the new thing called a cell phone, um, I was a, the 3M coordinator. I spent my day at the, the Barefoot Bar <coughs> um, reading a book and probably had, we'd have two or three beers and a burger and about every hour and a half I would get up and walk across, the, walk into the water and, and Honolulu come back, pull the chain, take a shower, and get back to my book. It was the greatest place to be in the world. But yeah, Hawaii was a great place. Wouldn't want to live there. Now that $6 a gallon for milk, not the way we used to go through it with the kids. Yeah, the Royal Hawaiian is, I don't forget who owns Royal Hawaiian now, but I, Hawaii was a great place. Great place to visit, except when it got cold and there was snow in Oahu. We really do need to get out of here, don't we? Yeah. Okay. Thank you.